This is the current federal tax developments for the week of July 31st, 2023. Current federal tax developments are brought to you by Kaplan Financial Education and by your state society of CPAs. I'm Ed Zollers coming to you from Phoenix, Arizona, where here on the last day, well, next to last day of July, joining us on Sunday, we've had some clouds move in that could destroy our record for being able to be above 110 for every day of the month of July as I. So we'll see how that comes out this afternoon. If we preserve our record or not, it does look like, as I see forecast for tomorrow, that it's unlikely we'll get every day in July because tomorrow looks to be much below 110 for a high. But hey, they're sometimes wrong on things like that here in Phoenix. So we'll, we'll keep watching. In any event, we're looking at tax developments here, not weather developments. So let's take a look at what we have this week. The main thing we're going to cover this week is a hearing that took place in the Oversight Committee of the House Ways and Means Committee, Oversight Subcommittee, that should be, that held a hearing on employee retention tax credit issues and also ended up with a discussion of a potential amnesty program to allow people that have filed and received the credit and now have come to the realization that, hey, you know what, I don't qualify for the credit how they could try to get back on the good graces with the IRS, uh, despite the fact they have a big problem being that they paid fees they're not going to get back. And they, you know, they, uh, so basically they can't afford to pay the entire credit back. So we'll talk a little bit about that. I don't know that we're going to see a solution to that problem, but it was one they discussed, plus some other issues related to the ERC. We're also going to talk that the IRS has announced that the revenue officer visits will be mainly ending. There are a couple of categories they say that they will continue to make, but as they put it in their release, these are ones that have a few hundred visits per year, as opposed to previously, revenue officers would make unannounced, vis unannounced visits to taxpayers, the initial visit, in tens of thousands of cases. So substantially down, we'll say, is a good way to look at that. And finally, we'll look at a tax court case for a taxpayer who found out there can be nasty tax consequences when you've taken a loan from your life insurance policy and then you simply allow the policy to lapse. Uh, in essence, it doesn't matter. You got no cash that year when the policy lapses. If the outstanding loan balance exceeds your basis in the policy, well, there's a tax event. And this is something we'll talk about, not so much because it's really that surprising a result under the law, at least to those of us who are tax pros, but it is something that most clients have no clue is a possibility. And quite often they ignore the letters they get from the insurance company stating, hey, your policy is going to lapse unless you essentially pay in X dollars. And they don't understand that they don't pay in that X dollars and start funding the policy again that they're going to be facing a tax bill, which could be significant. So we'll talk a little bit about that this week. Well, let's start out with the congressional hearing on the Oversight Subcommittee of the House Ways and Means Committee on July 27, held a hearing called the Employee Retention Tax Credit Experience, Confusion, Delays, and Fraud, right? Now, the thing to remember at this subcommittee hearing before you put too much into it, is that this was held as Congress is get, was getting ready to head out the door for the August recess. And in fact, they were trying to get votes in for certain things before the recess. And because of that, the, committee, the subcommittee chair noted that essentially a lot of members would be gone for a lot of the hearing. They'd be called to the floor to do votes or take care of other issues. And that's something that frankly, you know, you got used to when you watched it. In fact, even the chair of the subcommittee ended up being missing for part of the hearing, although the substitute had one of the better parts of the uh, actual day uh, when she played a voicemail that she received that morning from an ERC mill telling her that she would get $26,000 a employee for all the employees of her business. Now, as tax notes noted in their tax notes today, federal note in their story, um, you know, the representative in question had not actually been involved in a business. She was president of a marketing firm 10 years ago, but since then she'd gone on to other things. And so it's been 10 years since she was in a position where she would have been making decisions on that issue. 
And she even found it more than a little bit amusing uh, that Deb, quote unquote, had left this message for her. And, you know, recognize the problem it is, as she put it, who in the world wouldn't call back when they've just been told they're going to get $26,000? In essence, why people fall for this is pretty obvious. So we'll talk a little bit about that. The most significant discussions were, and certainly the most memorable ones, were focused on frauds coming from the ERC mills. There was another, there was a bit of a discussion about backlogs that talked a bit more, especially as it relate professional employer organizations. And I happen to think the reason for that is, and why the PEO representative at the hearing was so much in the backlogs is, I do believe the problem is that the IRS has not really been processing those very quickly, if at all, because they are inherently messy. We talk a little bit about that and why they are so messy, but I'm not surprised that the service could still be correct in their statement that 99% of, you know, basically uh, 99% of those being processed still at this point in time are current. Now, the subcommittee chair was a little confused, but he indicated that it was his understanding that it was either three months or six months from the date a claim is filed that the IRS considers it to be current under this program. But there is little question that PEOs are not moving within anywhere like that time frame. Their claims are generally not going to move that quickly. Okay. Now, there were four witnesses that appeared at the hearing. Actually, they are still taking written testimony all the way through the 10th of August. So if you go to the website that relates to this hearing, There actually are materials there that will tell you how to submit written testimony through August 10th if you have something to add to this conversation. So just be aware of that. Now, appearing there was Larry Grace, CPA, a partner with AGC CPA in Missouri. He also essentially was representing the National Association of Tax Professionals. He lectures, CPE work for them, and other items of that sort, also involved with government relations there. We also had appearing Roger Harris, president of Page Advisors, a syndicated group that does tax work around the country. And he and Larry were mainly there representing, dealing with the, shall we call them the retail customers. You know, the, the, the retail small business groups, small businesses that are being hammered with all of these, you know, solicitations via email, TV, radio, telephone, probably sending them a carrier pigeon if they could find one to go take it to you. You know, all the ways possible they're soliciting. And that's coming in. Oh, text message. Don't forget that. We also had Pat Cleary, who's president and CEO of the National Association of Professional Employer Associations, NAPEO. And he was there representing the interest of the professional employer organizations and the issues they're having with the ERC. And as I'll say, his interest is heavily in how slowly the IRS is moving on PEO claims. And the fact that the PEO claims each PEO, no matter how many employers it represents, their claim is considered one claim, even if there's 10,000 inherent in that filing or there are 20, it's still considered one claim. And his comment was he believes they're substantially undercounting the number of companies that have effectively claims pending that the IRS has not yet addressed. And then finally, we had uh, Linda Capizio, Capio. sorry, Linda, I'm mispronouncing your name. She is president and CEO from the New Jersey Center for Nonprofits. She was there to represent the nonprofit community and talking about how the program impacted them. Uh, she actually was very complimentary of the program in general. She also was unique among the group in that at least her organization itself and many of the uh, tax exempts she represented had managed to file their claims on 941s, which by the way, resulted in a way faster turnaround than if you had to go with the 941X, but that makes sense. 941s can be electronically filed, most are, and 941Xs cannot be electronically filed. You have to file paper. If there's one thing we know, in 2020, 2021, the IRS was not at all good at was handling paper filings. Everybody probably remembers that picture of that lunchroom at the the IRS service center where they have the boxes stacked with all of those paper filed returns, no, you know, correspondence, et cetera, that hadn't yet been processed. 
that the Taxpayer Advocates Office put out. And, you know, sending 941Xs, paper 941Xs, in to the service centers as the only way a taxpayer could claim, in many cases, the 2020 version of the credit. Because, remember, for the 2020 version, had they applied for a PPP loan, uh, they absolutely could not get the credit until we got to the end of the year, when in the budget bill at the end of the year, suddenly they opened the spigots and said, oh yeah, you can get that. The problem was, obviously, uh, maybe you could have fixed your fourth quarter notice, but again, timing was guidance and everything. Nothing got out. They did this the last second. People already had all their payroll stuff written, and it was unlikely anybody could make the fourth quarter even work. And the reality was that because it took a while for anybody, including members of the, uh, you know, members of the professional community to actually learn how this worked and how it happened, it's not surprising that A, all of 2020 was clearly going to be done by 941Xs and a good chunk of 2021, if you had the right to file the claim, would also end up being on amended claims, which obviously was far from optimal considering they had to be done on paper. Now, in the testimony, the live in-person testimony from the panel, some of the highlights were, um, you know, the, you know, those representing the tax, the retail tax people, you know, let's say, you know, the average rank and file business, small business, and those who serve them did point out that these ERC mills have put a lot of tax professionals in a very difficult position. You know, when they tell the client that they don't qualify for this payout of $26,000 for every employee because, you know, everybody gets it because everybody qualifies. And nobody in Congress, or I should say at least nobody on the subcommittee, seemed to come anywhere near endorsing any view that, in fact, the vast majority of businesses qualified for this credit. It was pretty clear that only maybe one was suggesting, and even there it was just the question whether owners could be paid, that was a whole different problem, uh, could receive the credit. But nobody there seemed to be indicating that it was reasonable uh, to take the position that everybody had a supply chain issue and everybody qualified for the credit. And that's kind of important because people always argue that, oh, well, congressional intent was not such that you know they wanted to be various things. It became pretty clear to me that congressional intent was not exactly in favor of the positions that most of the mills are advancing. And so that's it. But they did note that's a real problem. If you off, if you basically do your job, you end up financially harmed by the mills that aren't doing, that just aren't caring. And too often many aren't. In fact, Mr. Gray had actually taken some time and was discussing some contracts he had watched or he had reviewed that had been written by the mills that were offered up to clients if they signed off. And as he said, he had a couple there. He said, look, th this thing simply says the you know, the taxpayer, the, you know, the, the employer is the one that is going to certify that they qual, you know, the, that they, that in essence that, that we're relying on your statement that you qualify for this credit in essence, doing no due diligence, no checkup on that. And as he said, you had to start wondering, what are you paying them for? If they're not going to work up and help you determine if you qualify, and all they're going to do is take your payroll data, probably not even check it, and he said in his experience, not checking it against PP loan issues or other things, and just, you know, send back a, yeah, send in the 941 and here in each of the quarters, you know, take this much, and then put that on the claim for refund and just say basically, you know, claim for refund, no explanation for this because you weren't required to explain it on the 941 or even the 941X and then just claim it. He said, yeah, you know, what have you done? You've gotten them to do a little bit of math work, a little bit of summary work, about five minutes. It should probably take once they've ingested the payroll. And for that, they're getting 20, 30% of the refund. And, you know, and in fact, you know, you're, they're hanging you out to dry if the IRS comes in because they're going to simply say, oh, did they qualify? Well, they, they said they did talk to them. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it's kind of important to check little things like those details for your agreement. Uh, 
you know, Mr. Gray also noted and brought up the Office of Professional Responsibility guidance that suggested strongly that even if you were a CPA EA attorney, you were not involved with preparing the 941 X's, determining these people qualified for the credit, or any of that part, you weren't involved in that aspect of it, that you still nevertheless would be held accountable or could be held accountable for perpetuating the fraud if in fact the claim was fraudulent or the claim was erroneous, which could put you in trouble uh, merely by revising the income tax returns to take away a deduction for wages related to the credit. And that's true. And to be honest, uh, even before OPR said anything, uh, Aon of the AICPA, you know, Aon, which is the insurance carrier that gives out the AICPAs, uh, you know, or basically is the carrier they recommend to you, their group carrier, for purposes of getting uh, malpractice insurance, they even sent out a letter that said, you know, you really probably don't want to do those amendments or be involved in them because they see a high probability that many of these mills that popped up overnight will disappear overnight. And so if in fact the client gets examined and if it turns out that the mill really didn't do their job, uh, the only party still around that has some money that supposedly was a tax thing the client thinks was going to advise them on tax issues now they're going to worry about the niceties of payroll tax versus income tax uh, is the CPA and you're likely to have a lawsuit or a claim filed against you or a complaint with the state board. So their theory was don't do it. OPR says don't do it due to the rules under OPR, especially if you're involved, if you get into the exam. There is a real question after the Ridgely versus Lou case as to whether or not the OPR really has any authority over basic preparation. But the problem is, if this all comes apart, you are probably going to be yanked in as the representative or involved in representation with legal counsel the client may bring in to try to defend this thing. But if they lose it, they're going to basically bankrupt the business. And that can bring you into OPR problems very quickly in this sort of scenario. So be aware of all the problems. Now, as I said, PEOs, we went through specific complaints they had. Uh, the real problem is, if you're not aware, a professional employer organization submits a single 941 equivalent on behalf of all of the companies that it basically works for or provides labor for. Technically, they are the employer, right? So they're a single employer, but they do provide statements that break down by detail each specific of their customers and their employees and how this works. Now, the problem is, of course, since they're filing 941, the credit has to come to them. And that creates a couple of problems for POs. Number one, uh, they have to sign off on it. And the IRS has made it clear, which is probably correct, that they're going to be liable, jointly liable with their customer. If it turns out the customer said they qualified because they got this bill coming in and they said they qualified and it turns out they don't. So that's a real headache for these groups. And also because they're probably, and I've heard of PEOs doing this now, they're going to want to delay filing the claim anyway until such time as everybody has come in and prepared their claim. You know, they're going to give people a deadline saying, well, you got till this date to get the claim into us so we can file it. And then they will file the one big batch claim rather than having to file a claim for refund. And then while it's in process, having to amend it every time a new customer says, oh, I qualify for ERC. So yeah, it is kind of a mess, the PEO site. And then it doesn't surprise me that the IRS, because again, if I pick up and start working a PEO's claim, I got 10,000, let's say, different employers, and I have to really determine for each one if they qualify, right? There's no way to make a generic overall overarching view that the PEO's customers all under that claim qualify. Each one would have to qualify separately and the PEO's on the hook. If, if any of them don't qualify, both the PEO and that employer could be on the hook if the refund has been paid already. So yeah, it's a real mess for PEO's. I do think though that that's probably where the reports now are coming from things being delayed for months or years on the claims. And if you actually have a client that is filing their own 941s, 
likely their claims will be processed quicker now. Maybe not fast, but quicker. And so there's probably less of an issue there because it didn't seem like any of the other uh, people testifying were nearly as concerned about, you know, the backlog. They, they seem to believe that their backlogs had been cleared for the most part. So we got to that standpoint. But again, if your client uses a PEO, it doesn't matter that all these other people would have cleared. And obviously the PEO industry does not like being blamed for the fact that their customers haven't got their credit money yet while all their buddies who didn't pay a PEO have got their credit. So yeah, that's a problem. And the, all, and the nonprofit representative, um, you know, Linda, I won't mispronounce her last name again, uh, you know, as she pointed out, her organization, she was very, very, uh, shall we say, you know, really complimented the use of the payroll tax system to get this money in. And she also, you know, found that it turned around very quickly. But the big difference was it looks like her organization was using 941s and filing electronically and filing the Form 7200 to get refunds. And if you use that system, the problem was for most companies that got a PP loan, they didn't even know that system was there. Uh, they weren't aware. And by the time they finally got up to speed about how everything worked, probably most of the quarters were done. Maybe they could do it right quote unquote, the third quarter. And then if they did that in the fourth quarter and they started sending in 7200s and then Congress retroactively repeals the law, yeah, it was a mess. So bottom line, but for nonprofits who filed 941s and at least for all quarters except for the fourth quarter of you know 2021 where it was on, then it wasn't. Yeah, it probably worked a bit better for them. But she also mentioned the problem of the scammers who are soliciting, you know, people in her group or a nonprofit group in New Jersey of all the non of the nonprofits in New Jersey. They're being hit by these scammers as well. So that was a big issue as we did it. Okay. Um, one of the issues that came up and especially we paid a lot of attention uh, to this in the questioning it, that was run by the chair of the subcommittee. Representative Schweikert uh, resulted around this problem of what about taxpayers who filed the claim, have gotten the refund, and now are being told because they're showing up at their CPA, their EA, whoever, and oh, by the way, I got this. The CPA or EA looks at the claim and goes, yeah, no, no, you don't qualify. No, you don't, you just absolutely don't qualify. You know, you don't there, and or this report is so bad and so limited that you're missing 90 percent of the information that you're going to need to defend that you comply with section 2301 of the cares act you meet the requirements for a full or partial suspension right and and that section both as it was in the original cares act for 2020 and as amended for 2020 as it was for the first six months of 2021, which again, simply amended the CARES Act provision. And then finally in section 3134 of the uh, Internal Revenue Code, because it got moved in there at the very end. And all of them use the same partial suspension rules. And so even if you're gonna tell me that notice 2020, 2021, 20, I should say, is, well, it's not valid, it wouldn't be controlling it. That's all fine. You still got to be able, though, to prove the items that are in the code or in the statute. And that, under 2301, requires you to show 2301C, you know, requires us to find specific government orders, right, to tie them back to our operations, to show when they applied, to show the implications on how they impacted our business and how that impact was sufficient to qualify as a suspension, full or partial. And again, I've always, I've said all along, the word suspension bothers me to no end, because that, that suggests when you suspend something, you stop doing it. There needs to be something, you might argue, if you just go by the plain meaning of the words, and you're not gonna go and use the uh, notice, then under plain meaning of the words, I need a suspension, something we had to stop doing that represents not just stopping doing some minor detail like allowing people to park in one parking space in our parking lot. Not saying that COVID would have required that, any order would have required that, 
But I'm saying that that would be considered to be a minor hindrance to a business, right? Something like that. Uh, versus having to stop doing, like let's say you know you have a firm that offered accounting services and you offered, I don't know, you sold ice cream. You 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 were a you know you, you ran a Ben and Jerry's franchise and a taxes. Interesting combo, but okay. I mean, I could see having been shut down from being able to run a sit-down ice cream operation, that that would be a suspension if there's other parts of the business that kept going. But it's tougher to find out what many of the mills are pushing on that theory. So really the magic words that notice 2021-20 isn't binding doesn't mean everything goes, right? You don't go from A to B. You still got to be able to tie it into the law. And the law, unless it's unconstitutional, the law does matter. So we need to be there. So those that have paid, you know, now got a big refund, a couple million dollars back. They paid in 20%, let's say, or 25% or 30% of the refund amount they received, the credit amount they received. They paid it back to the company, back to the, um, the promoter as fees. Now we got a problem. Yes, I got a $2 million credit, but I paid 20% of that back as, you know, my fee. That'd be $400,000. So I only got a million six. And if I file a, you know, a 941X and I amend my amendment, I'm going to have to write a check back for the $2 million plus the interest. And the problem is I don't even have $2 million around anymore. If, if I'm lucky, I banked million six. Most didn't do that. So we're going to have a big problem. How do these companies even try to get in? And so, you know, there was a problem. We filed the claim, you filed the claim, you may have spent the funds, you've got the fees gone. So how do we do it? Now, the subcommittee chair, as I said, had questions led to consideration of certain options. And, you know, M Mr. Gray did suggest, the CPA, uh, that maybe they consider what they did with the uh, issues involving cryptocurrency. You know, we had a feeling that some people, because information were able to obtain from Coinbase, other, other locations, that looks like some taxpayers should have probably had some sort of cryptocurrency information or income on the return. They didn't. So I sent out a series of soft letters offering people the chance to voluntarily come in from the cold. Uh, the theory being that the IRS might do the same for claims that have been paid out that upon review, just seem like there's a good chance there's a problem with them. Right. It's, it's for an industry where it doesn't make sense what kind of a shutdown would have been involved. You know, they have maybe it's, you know, in a city or state where there were very, very, very few orders and they weren't in a business that was seen to be covered by such orders. I mean, all these things that just seem like there might be a problem here. Uh, send out soft letters and, you know, say, hey, you might want to consider voluntarily, you know, changing this if you now believe after the details we've given you that you may not qualify and also advise them about the simple fact that yes you do have to go back and reduce the deductions you claim for wages for any year you claim the erc from that is a requirement and if you don't do that don't be surprised if you get penalized right you need to do those sorts of things so that's the key now the chair did seem to understand the fee issue uh, but he also said he had concerns about you know he didn't really want the uh, ERC mills to get away with it and just be able to pocket the money and keep it. And, you know, the government and the taxpayers would pick up the hit. You know, as he said, you know, we, we really shouldn't be, you know, it, it shouldn't be a case where, where taxpayers that, you know, did their due diligence, actually did what they should have done and discovered that this was too good to be true and didn't file the claims and didn't file the false claims that they should somehow be in worse position than those that just did no due diligence and went along with the right. You know, and just said, yeah, we're going to do. But he also understands that some of those that went along did so innocently. So he's kind of discussing options, but he didn't really commit to any. And remember, they are leaving town. So I wouldn't expect any amnesty program, if it requires legislative work, to see the light of day anytime soon. There was some discussion of backlog, although, you know, and there was some back and forth about whether it was true that, in fact, the backlog had been resolved. 
I think they all came to the conclusion that once you considered the PEOs, that it was not the case that 99% of claims, you know, that are current have been, you know, 99% of claims have been processed, uh, you know, and only 1% of claims in processing currently represent claims that are not current, that are past, you know, that are past the current stage. Uh, but I think the real problem then was we've seen a spike in claims. And in fact, we had a discussion on this. It was on Twitter that it came up uh, and it was, you know, somebody was looking at the stats and, you know, just kind of posted there. And uh, Richard Rubin of the Wall Street Journal responded. That's how I saw it come up in my feed. Uh, but, you know, it said, what the heck happened at the IRS? That's, you know, to the IRS at this point, what changed? And suddenly we saw this massive spike in paper filed amended returns to the IRS. And as Richard concluded, and I also chimed in and said, yep, that's right, because the 941X has to be on paper. It's got to be employee retention credit claims. You know, it was, and it, it was a massive spike. I mean, we've seen a massive spike this year in those returns. I'm thinking some of the reason why the numbers, why the IRS could say they've gone through 90, you know, in essence, they are now up to date and, you know, 99% of claims have been processed, uh, you know, at this point that were filed within the la that three month window or six month window, whichever it might be. Why that could be correct, and yet they still could show hundreds of thousands of returns as not being processed. The reason why is they're still getting more in than they're able to process per week, and they're currently processing, I think at the committee, we were told about 70,000 per week. But they're getting in, they're still getting in more than that many at this point in time on a weekly basis. There was a little bit of discussion on IRS guidance. However, that was a little more interesting. Now, Mr. Gray did note how the guidance can be important. He talked about last week's memo we discussed, where the IRS made it very, very clear that they would not go along with most extended supply chain theories. Uh, you had to document things. And if you don't have things documented, you're not going to make them work. He said that specific memo, when he could finally show that to one client who was, he was having a tough time convincing her that she shouldn't apply for the credit because she saw this million dollar plus that the, you know, the outside vendor was saying, oh yeah, you qualify for this, no problem. You're going to get it. Uh, he said when he showed her that letter and presumably one of the theories that the outside vendor was using to say, oh yeah, you qualify was in there. That suddenly got her to say, no, nope, no way, not doing it, right? I'm just not going to do it. I reject it. And I do think he's right. I've always found that if you get something on IRS letterhead, uh, most clients will respect that. I hate to say it far more than they're going to respect your, you know, your deep analysis of the law, regardless of the fact that your analysis of the law and that IRS memo literally have the same force in court, right? It doesn't matter. Neither one binds a court. And both are just the opinions of, you know, the side in front of the court and their particular, you know, backup for their position. Uh, but nevertheless, they, as soon as they realize that, then they understand that if they do this, the IRS, if they get examined, is not going to back off on this. And therefore, they're going to end up with having to defend an IRS exam and very likely having to go to court. And that means they don't need the bother. So even for a million dollars, or two million or whatever, they will ignore the issue. So yes, I would agree with Mr. Gray, if the IRS got out more guidance like that, it really would be helpful. Um, but the problem is they never really discuss the structural problems. Because remember that line that the notices aren't binding. And you will, every time you talk to an ERC consultant, you will hear that line about notices aren't binding and they will poo poo and treat the notices as if they are totally worthless and they don't matter at all, don't even look at them, which I always find amusing because they almost always are basing their claims somehow indirectly on a supply chain theory that only exists in the notice. It's not in the law at all, but they're going to use the supply chain notice theory to try to get in there, which was an invention of, and at least one person I know that actually thinks there are some, you know, the notices really don't work all the way. You know, he says flat out that he thinks the service at this point is probably uh, regretting they put that question and answer in the notice because even he believes that the law itself said nothing about that. There's no reason to believe that worked until the IRS suddenly said, hey, here it is. And he thinks that's what opened up the door wide 
for the ERC mills to start trying to run with what, as a practical matter, I would read, and I think he kind of reads too, as a very generous uh, safe harbor that probably doesn't have support in the law, but the IRS won't challenge you. And, you know, that's been expanded. So I love it when they tell me, don't pay attention to the notice. And they're obviously using the notice because they're using that. They're using the 10, they're using the 10% test for whether the effect is nominal. And again, none of that's in the law. It's all in the notice that they tell me is worthless. Well, and they will also be very correct, as I told you, that that memo is worth even less. Right? Notices are still considered in the IRB are given much more respect than IRS memos that, you know, come out the way this one did. Those are just kind of, you know, the opinion pieces of attorneys inside the IRS, you know, chief counsel's office, which again is our attorneys that work a lot with tax law, but it's just their write up. They they don't have themselves the right to set rules or write even write right, you know, regs have to have certain things happen to go through a process. And these memos don't go through that process. But the problem is that Congress had spent a lot of time in recent years, you know, saying and coming down hard that agencies should not be putting out these this sub-regulatory guidance and everything needs to go full, through the full regulation process. And the problem is the full regulation process of proposed regs and hearings and then replying to the hearings, maybe issuing another proposed reg to take into account the changes you think they're making based on what you got back in the hearings, et cetera. That takes years. And it was also true that there were not, you know, the ERC was not the only change in the late December law. And there were still issues from the laws that Congress had passed all throughout 2020 before that. There is no way it's realistic for the IRS to get out regulation guidance that's fully vetted all the way in a time frame, especially when Congress passed this bill. And less than a month later, 941 is going to have to go in that took this into account if you want to do it on time. So I think Congress has to be a little clearer about, wait, you, you can't complain about lack of guidance and then basically hamstring the agency on giving guidance. You know, we need to know one or the other. And that, that's where the problem comes is that's a structural issue that Congress would have to deal with. Congress could authorize methods, they just haven't. Or imagine this, Congress could actually write laws that uh, answer the major questions instead of leaving everything a bit vague and doing it. Like, it would have been really helpful if Congress actually put a definition in the law of suspension and what a partial suspension has to be, as opposed to just leaving them in there by themselves with no obvious frame of reference as to what they are. But I'll get off my soapbox now for a second. Now, there were some other things that happened this week on the ERC. There was a lot of ERC stuff to go on this week. Uh, in Treasury Decision 9978, the IRS issued final regulations that will allow them to use deficiency procedures to collect excess credits if they determine you've been overpaid on the credit. They can go through the standard deficiency and treat it as an underpayment of tax. Uh, if they don't do that, technically the IRS would ask you for the money back. You'd say no. And they would have to go, then they could go formally, then they would go formally to court and file suit. Because the only way they got to actually recover it, because this would not be a tax, right? And at least certainly not the amount that represents the non refund, that represents a refundable credit, would not really be a tax. It's a payment. So they would have to file suit. Now they can do that. They still can do that. That's an option. They don't have to treat it as a tax. But honestly, the IRS would prefer to go through the standard assessment routines, deficiency procedures, and collect excess tax, open up the um, you know, administrative options for dealing with this before we got to court, and at least you know, clear that up so they're not to file court cases against everybody that they question the ERC on. So that did become final. There have been temporary regs issued back in 2020. It was finalized this week's. And in a news release, IR 2023-135 on July 26th, uh, the IRS announced a shift to ERC enforcement work, stating that they'd caught up on processing claims. And the uh, commissioner was making a statement at the Atlanta Tax Forum, the IRS hosted, 
this week that essentially said the same thing. You know, we've caught up on processing and now we're devoting to ERC enforcement. We do know enforcement actions are out there. I have talked with multiple attorneys, CPAs, who are handling exams right now that are related to the employee retention tax credit. So these things are open. I know of ones in Phoenix here, right, that are currently working. You know, in fact, an attorney who is working, which surprised another attorney I knew, uh, who in a different part of the country mainly works with state taxes, uh, that in fact, you know, an attorney here in Phoenix with one of the major firms was cur had currently, as of about a month ago, had 10 open exams on ERC that he was handling, you know, we're, we're in various stages and some mills and some other structures that have been involved in it. Yeah, he was doing because he was surprised. Why, why would an attorney handle payroll? Tax? The numbers, right? These companies are potentially facing going out of business if they lose the exams. And they're in this position only because they, they saw the dangling free money and they went for it and didn't question if it's too good to be true. And that's a major problem facing a lot of these organizations. So what's coming up next? Well, as I said, Congress is out on recess and when they return, they're likely gonna be focused on government funding. So it's unlikely we'll see any action there soon. But as I noted, it was funny in the hearing, not only did the Congresswoman who took over the, uh, the hearing when Chairman Swikert uh, had to go out for a vote, not only did she, in her questioning time, play back that voicemail from Deb, uh, and I'll put it this way, she was not too enamored with Deb or this, and I would say, you know, she is the chair, and just, I know people get very concerned about red versus blue, so I'll make it very clear, this is the House, chairmanships in the House, and people they hand it over to to run are going to be in the majority party. And I don't think anyone's ever considered this particular representative. Van Den is her name. Uh, she's from Texas. Uh, I don't think anybody's ever considered her anything but a very conservative lawmaker, uh, you know, who essentially, right, is not really going to be a normally a friend of the IRS, but she had absolutely no respect for this particular, you know, ERC scammer, and it is kind of funny as I quipped, uh, probably not a smart idea to call a member of the subcommittee, especially somebody senior enough to be handed the gavel when the chairman walks out. It's probably not a good idea to call her the morning of the hearing, leave a voicemail. What's even better though, remember the individual representing the PEOs, he got a call that he, he said he saw the number when it came up, he was on his cell phone, he was driving into DC, he saw this number on his phone. He didn't recognize it, but he decided to answer it because like I would probably think too, I don't know about, you know, the phone numbers of all the staff members, et cetera, from Congress. I'm going up for this hearing. It might be from them. I should, I, I answer it because I don't know who it is from. And now I'm sitting here saying, well, it might be, you know, somebody from the hearing and it may be something I need to know. So I pick up and answer the phone and it was Heather who had basically the same story for him about how he could qualify for $26,000 per, and he said, he said, even after he told her who he was, that he was, you know, involved, he represented PEOs. He knew payroll tax law inside and out, right? He really didn't need the help of her organization. She still stayed on script and kept pushing him and saying, oh, no, you don't know. The people you talk to don't know anything about this law, which is, Kind of interesting. Uh, I did have an interesting screen swap there. Let me go ahead and get this back. Accidentally hit, hit the laptop in front here and yeah, it did weird things on screen. So if you're watching the video, that was interesting. Uh, but anyway, so we're gonna have this at this point. Now the IRS has talked about a couple of times in the recent past doing some sort of program to simplify coming in from the cold. But I have a feeling they're not going to do anything about the fee problem. In essence, you can come in from the cold if, if you pay the entire amount you got and you pay back the interest, uh, but we won't charge penalties. Well, as was noted, that, that may not be of much help to many of these organizations. But again, Congress is likely to take quite a while to get to this. So that's where we stand. Okay, other things that happened th this week, and let me go ahead and move forward to the next slide. 
The IRS announced on July 24th they're going to end unannounced revenue officer visits to taxpayers. And, you know, the title of this major change in confusion enhanced safety as part of a larger agency transformation effort. It's news release IR 2023-133 issued on July the 24th of 2023. And what it says fundamentally is IRS revenue officers will no longer initially visit a taxpayer's location without giving prior notice in most cases. This is not one that is true all the way through. There are still some will be done. Generally, though, for most, the vast, vast majority of times before when they would have visited the client's location initially, they'll since contact them via an appointment letter. Its number is 725B. You might want to make a note of that just in case the client calls. Uh, that'll be the letter number. And they will want to schedule an appointment with the client before showing up at their door. Okay. Now, there are still limited cases where there'll be no notice. And these are ones primarily where it's there, there's a real risk to the government that if they gave notice that the people trying to escape collection would suddenly you know, move assets out of where they could get them. So it will be for cases of summonses and subpoenas. We know people like to try to dodge those. Um, so they're, gonna, they're not going to you know, call you and say, we need to schedule a time to give you a subpoena or give you a summons. Well, might not get a lot of cooperation on that, and the client may suddenly, and the you know, taxpayer may go into hiding as soon as you do that. So there's a reason why those will just knock on your door and say, congratulations, you've been served. Okay. Also, if they are in the process of seizing assets, you know, jeopardy assessments and things like that, and they're going out to seize assets that are at risk where they could easily be moved outside of where the U.S. government could access them, you know, moving various things offshore, uh, you know, moving, you know, so let's say they, they got a bunch of gold coins. They just figure out a way to try to, you know, hide, just move them out of the country quickly. And so the government can't catch them. So those would be there. Now, the IRS noted that the cases in those categories number at most a few hundred per year compared with tens of thousands of visits for other reasons. So these are a relatively minor portion of what causes issues. Now, why has this been done? Part of it is obviously IRS PR. You know, their idea is, and there's been concerns, and I've expressed them too. You know, how in the world, does, how in the world do you tell your clients, uh, you know, no, the IRS won't, won't show up at your door or call you first, when in collections, they do just that. And so somebody showing up at their door who's not with the IRS could claim to be that and end up really majorly defrauding the client. Uh, but also, IRS agents, as we note, are facing, not surprisingly in today's rather high-level, um, you know, very, very, shall we say, partisan environment, where people are very, very hot and don't care a whole lot about whether something is true or false. Uh, you know, we, 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 figure out our, we figure out what we believe, and then we find the things to back us up. And I'm not suggesting that's one political persuasion or the other, because I see it from all kinds of people who just basically, you know, show wild levels of confirmation bias. So obviously, you know, if you believe that IRS agents are showing up, you know, and, you know, at gunpoint to go after people in the middle of the night, you know, so they're jumping them and at gunpoint showing up and seizing everything without ever having contacted them before. You know, obviously that's a problem because as you'll point out, these revenue officers are not armed, right? And so it doesn't make sense to just pop them on somebody who is likely to be upset, mad, and could do harm to the agent or to the, to the officer. By the way, yes, please tell your clients, the only people that show up from the IRS with guns are from CID, General Investigation Division, and if they show up, shooting at them is probably not good because shooting at cops usually gets you in lots of trouble. So, and they're cops. So bottom line, if they show up, call your attorney. And by the way, no, don't let them in the home. <laughs> uh, unless they have the warrant, don't let them in the home. And number two, don't talk to them whatever you do until you have legal counsel, gang. Okay? So if they show up and they got the badge and the gun, call counsel. Don't talk to them, <laughs> right? And um, you know, call counsel. Don't talk to them. Uh, you know that whole thing. I realize CID probably won't like me for saying it that way, but 
Reality is no. And I say this as somebody who is a family member in law enforcement, and the same thing's true. You know, you just don't do it because, you know, what you say can end up being taken various ways, and it's just better to have somebody in legal counsel take a look who understands what they're looking at and who will keep you from even by accident getting yourself in into a mess that takes forever to unwind simply because you said the wrong thing. So yes, guns people, just be careful. Don't, but, but don't shoot at them. That, that's probably not a good idea to do, especially since they're armed and trained. Uh, and, you know, it depends on how good your training is, but hey, you know, probably not as good as theirs. So I just wouldn't suggest doing it. It's just my own take. Yeah, legal counsel is much better in that scenario. Finally, let's talk about the case of Doggart versus Commissioner Tax Court Summary Opinion 2023-25. This one came down July the 27th. Now, in 2017, the taxpayer was incarcerated. He's having a bad year. It ends up being put in the pen. Okay. Now, he had previously gotten a life insurance policy and in the past had borrowed money against that policy. And we all know how that works, right? You know, the agent tells you here, you know, you can buy this policy, you pay into it, it'll give us life insurance benefits if you need it. But hey, on top of that, you know, once you've paid into it long enough, you'll have built up cash value. You can borrow that out tax-free. It's earning and you can borrow it out. It's tax-free. It's great. It's wonderful. They don't really, though, explain exactly how this works, and that's where you get in trouble, and this is where this guy got in trouble. Okay, he got thrown in jail. Seems like there are not as many important things as, you know, it may not be quite as important to pay your life insurance, uh, you know, bills, because it, you know, I don't know that many people now are, as many people are relying on you uh, for, you know, for supplying their, keeping them housed and fed, etc. And if they are, they got issues anyway. So probably paying for life insurance is not one of the things you'd want to keep doing. So he stopped paying on the policy once he was incarcerated. And the way this works obviously is, you know, the cash value. Yes, in most, many cash values policies, you can stop paying. But you still incur the charges against policies, administrative costs, uh, as well as the basic one-year term that represents the death benefit in excess of the cash value of the policy. Now, when those expenses knock the cash value down and the cash value is approaching and will, if it keeps going, go below the outstanding balance of the loan plus interest, that's when the policy, you'll get a warning, the policy is going to lapse and they're going to basically take the cash value and use it to pay off the loans before you get upside down and terminate the policy. And you'll be told you have so much time to, in essence, send money in to keep the policy in force. And if you fail to do so, then the policy will be terminated and will lapse. Well, that's exactly what happened in this case. The policies lapsed in 2017. Now, Prudential had two 1099Rs, it appears were two policies, and they showed taxable distributions to this taxpayer based on the lapsing and offsetting the cash value against the, you know, his basis in the contract, right? Now, he did not file a 2017 return. He argued he had no income from life insurance. He didn't get anything in 2017. How could he have income when he never got anything that year? And even when he kind of got explained to him about this whole bit about offsetting the cash value, he said, well, if the loan was taxable, then it was taxable back when he got it, which was in 2017. Which actually is a better argument. Doesn't work, you understand. But at least it's, 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 it's getting us something that would be possible, right? Because year of taxation is important. It doesn't matter when a 1099 is issued. We look to the year when the taxable event took place, right? And unfortunately for him, the law does not work in this case that you have to have received the cash in the year in question. As long as when you receive the cash, it was a valid note. That's the problem we're going to run into here. So the opinion talks about the general tax rules under Section 72 for when you cash out your life insurance policy. And the general rule is, by, you know, as long as the policy is in force, generally the cash value grows inside the policy. I don't pay tax on that. That cash value is used, essentially the whole plan 
ignoring the borrowing case yet, but the general plan is that that cash value builds up over the time of the policy, and it begins reducing the amount of current period insurance I have to buy and pay for in order to pay for the death benefit, because that's what you do in a, in a quote, permanent policy, is that you are paying every year for a effectively a term policy for that year that will provide the debt. It's oversimplifying, but roughly the way it worked is you're paying for a term policy that will provide the unfunded death benefit. Now, some, and there are so many options here, it gets ridiculous. There are some cases where you get the death benefit plus the cash value. We're going to ignore all that stuff. Let's talk about the normal case where the cash value, in essence, you get the death benefit. And what you're getting is going to be when you're when you die, your heir would get the death benefit, would get the cash value, plus whatever is needed to push that up to the uh, insured amount on the policy. So that's how it would work. Now, if you just decide, hey, I don't need this policy anymore. I have cash value in it of two hundred thousand dollars, and my total premiums over the year were seventy thousand. If I cash that out, I can just get a check from the insurance company for two hundred thousand dollars. And I'll have 130,000 taxable, all that earnings that's been put in there in excess of what I put in my basis in the policy. So my debt earnings in excess of my base in the policy, and I would pay tax on that 130. Now, the receipt of cash when you borrow against the policy, as long as it's a bona fide loan, has interest, et cetera, subject to repayment, as long as it's bona fide, it's not initially taxable. Just as if I go down to Bank of America and I borrow $20,000 today on, let's say, just a, let's say, a line of credit, that is not taxable to me when I get it because I have to repay B of A. In this case, you have to repay the insurance company or, you know, you, or, or it's going to, whatever balance is in there is going to reduce the debt, reduce the debt benefit when I die. So it'll be covered in that case. And as we'll discover, if cash value is taken out to pay off to pay the loan, that's constructive distribution. And that's going to be a problem. That's going to be just like I took the 200000 So let's say I borrowed the money out. Now with accrued interest, it's gone to $200,000. Um, and that's equal to my cash value. And I'm not paying premiums in. And when the insurance company comes to me and say, pays premiums or this thing's going to be forfeited, I just say, we'll take it. I'm not giving you any more. I don't need this anymore. So just take it. That's going to be considered a constructive distribution or essentially the insurance company taking the cash value and paying off the loan you have. And that will be when they take that cash value, that will be a constructive distribution, just like you got cash and you'll pay taxes if you got cash for it, which obviously can be expensive, as we've said. Now, the real problem we have here is not this case, because I think everybody here pretty much knew he'd lose it. But the problem is our clients don't understand this issue at all, right? Likely because of marketing related to the loans and the insurance policy, right? It's just obvious. Um, the marketing pushes this as a tax-free source of income at some point in the future, retirement, when their kids go to college, whatever. This is a tax-free source of funds in the future. It seems like magic. Right, you can invest in here while the investment grows. You're not taxed on it, but unlike a retirement plan, you know, an I, standard IRA, uh, when you take the money out, you're not taxed on it. Right, you, you don't don't pay tax when you take it out. You know, it just it, you never have to pay it according to this because you'd borrow it, and hey, you'd be fine. The problem is that this all requires you to actually keep the policy alive to keep the tax benefit keep the tax the taxable amount from being triggered. So what happens is eventually your client gets a letter from the carrier that the policy is about to be surrendered, they need to pay in dollar x or they're going to lose their policy. The client doesn't think that's a big problem because hey, you know, I don't need the policy anymore. Uh, I'm not I no way I'm going to write him a check for $20,000. So and it can be significant sometimes what you have to put in keep this thing running. So they, they just decide to skip it and ignore it. That's the way they do it. They also failed that, to realize the interest charge on loan counts. 
So even though they never got cash for the interest, they owed the interest. And if they don't pay it and it adds to the loan, then the cash value will pay off that interest as well, which is non-deductible, right? It's going to be personal interest for the most part, unless you can trace it somewhere else. So that's a problem. Now you might want to notify clients of the tax rules regarding life insurance. The key thing I'll tell clients, give it this way. And the way I phrase it is, you know, the, this whole tax-free nature only works if you die before the policy does. Yeah, I mean, that's a tongue-in-cheek way of phrasing it, but the policy has to survive you. If that policy is terminated before you die and you borrowed out in excess with interest, in excess of what you paid in the policy, there's going to be a tax event. You have to keep the policy alive. Good agents will work that into their calculations and will warn their customers you don't want to borrow more than these levels. If you start getting, if it starts going to be this percentage or so of the cash value, we need to have a talk about trying to fix things here because it's not an endless supply. You don't have really access to every dollar that's there, especially if you're deciding not to pay or you've been told this was a disappearing premium policy. Again, when you're borrowing, you start making it tougher for that premium to disappear. And anyway, in any event, sometimes disappearing premiums don't disappear. We talk about that's all another long discussion with life insurance, uh, but that's where they get in trouble. If the cash balance is offset against the death benefit when the insured dies, that's when it becomes truly tax exempt income was received on the note on the loans. Now remember, you've taken that money from your heirs, right? It's going to reduce the heir what the heirs get, but so your option is to pay back the loan or get a reduction to the heirs. But that's why it is considered to be, it can be totally exempt because now you, the cash is being used to pay a death benefit that itself is not taxable. And so that actually makes it work. But that's the key. So you, they need to be aware that if they ever, ever, ever see that letter come from the insurance company, they have to realize that cashing out the policy, is, which is what they're going to be doing, is going to generate a cash effect and quite often it's spelled out in the letter. That actually works that way. Clients are shocked. They don't understand it, but gang, that's how it works. Okay, this has been the Current Flow Tax Developments for the week of July the 31st, 2023. Current Flow Tax Developments, as always, is brought to you by Kaplan Financial Education and your State Society of CPAs. Uh, you can email me at edzollers at currentflowtaxdevelopments.com if you have questions. Uh, also, I am on uh, the Connect sites for the Arizona Society, New Jersey Society, Illinois Society, um, Washington Society, and Minnesota Society of CPAs. So if you have questions, you can post them there. I also watch a discussion group on Idaho. I'm also known to participate on, let's say, on Twitter or X. I guess it's X now. Yeah, X marks the spot, whatever. Uh, but Ed Zollers is my handle there. It's also my handle on threads. I'm over there as well. I figure that I'll post wherever I can post. Um, so I'll be at either case. If you do either one of those, you can follow me. The handle is the same at Ed Zollers. In either case, we'll take you there. Uh, and otherwise, we'll see what comes up this week. Uh, and we'll talk about new developments might take place in the area of federal taxes when we come back to talk to you next week. <music>